mystery moons. When we look up into the sky, we see our moon orbiting around the Earth, and very lovely it is too. But what about other planets? Well, I always read that um, we had one, that Mars had two, Jupiter had 12, Saturn nine, Uranus five, and Neptune two. And poor old little Pluto, Mercury and Venus had none at all. But is that the whole of the story? Well, in 1978, the story started to change. And that was the discovery 40 years after Pluto itself had been found that Pluto had a large moon called Charon, so large that they're really a double planet and they orbit round each other. Each keeps the same face pointing towards its neighbour. And then the New Horizons programme sent a mission out to Pluto and as it approached it found two more so pluto went from having one moon to having three four objects in orbit around each other and as it approached even further in addition to nix and hydra we found Styx and kerberos so there are now six or ob orbiting objects pluto and five moons quite an amazing change well i'd also asked questions about whether it was possible for small solar system objects to have moons, such as asteroids. I wondered if they would have enough gravity to hold on to a moon in the face of perturbations from their big neighbours like Jupiter. And the discovery of Ida with its moon Dactyl put an answer to that question. This is a lovely image of Ida, some slightly potato-shaped asteroid with its little tiny moonlet Dactyl. And we now know that a lot of asteroids are actually accompanied by smaller objects or indeed are double asteroids such as uh, Didymus and Dimorphus that the DART mission went to or even the lost asteroid Hermes turned out to be double. So that left us with a mystery as to why the inner planets Mercury and Venus are on their own. Why do they not have moons? And in 1974, the Mariner spacecraft took a flyby of Mercury. So the graphic of Mariner and a picture of Mercury. And what happened was that the UV spectrometer spotted some emissions coming from the general direction of Mercury. But the next day, they had gone. And three days later, they were back again. The conclusion was, ah, this is a moving object, and it must be quite close to Mercury because we're pointing our instruments at Mercury. Mercury has a moon. This was the dis discovery detection of the fact that Mercury had a moon around it. And analysis of the changing position the movement seemed to be about right for a small body in orbit around this tiny little planet close to the sun well the next day a press conference was organized and excited stories started to circulate in the press about mercury and its new moon but as the observations continued the moon just kept on going and it kept moving away and away as the spacecraft was approaching Mercury and Mercury was going around the sun. And eventually it was determined to be a background star, 3-1 Crataris, um, a very hot star, accounting for where all that ultraviolet light was coming from. Very, very embarrassing for those associated with having told the press of this new discovery. But this wasn't the first time we'd had the discovery of a moon on these inner planets. And I want to tell you about Neith, the moon of Neptune. This was first reported way back in 1672 by the astronomer Cassini. He had seen an object near to Venus in the sky. A few years later, he saw it again. And he reported that it was a quarter the size of Venus. And crucially, it showed the same phase. 
not a star-like point of light as the mariner mistake, but here he was seeing uh, something that appeared to be planet-like, obviously spherical and showing phase from the light from the sun. And having the same phase is exactly what you would expect, because obviously if the two are close to each other in the space, then their direction between us and the sun and them is going to be very similar. More reports of this detection came through for the next 200 years almost. And it was given the name Neith. So confident were people that they had made this observation. Well, our textbooks don't report Venus having a moon, let alone one called Neith, anymore, do they? And the reason was that during that period of time, telescopes having been invented early in the 1600s, 70 years later, Cassini had finally got a, a fairly decent sized telescope and they got bigger and bigger and bigger over the next 150 to 200 years. But the lens making wasn't quite as sophisticated as it is in the most modern instruments of today. And in particular, there was problems with the coating of the lenses, creating uh, anti-reflective surfaces, which uh, help enormously. If you don't have an anti-reflective coating, then the light can come into the top of your telescope through the lens, all the way down the tube to the eyepiece at the bottom, and it can reflect off the eyepiece lens, off the surface of it, some of the light. Some of it goes through into your eye, but some will travel back up the tube and out. But a portion of it will also reflect a second time off the inside of the main lens and come back down the tube and through the eyepiece and create a second false image. And these double images that these early refractors were creating had a nasty habit of producing a double image a quarter the size of the main image uh, because of the curved surfaces involved. And this explains where Neath had come from. The telescopes were getting bigger and capturing more light. And because they were doing so, this doubly reflected but false image was becoming visible. Previous to that, it would have been there, but it would have been so faint you wouldn't have noticed. So sadly, Neath, I'm afraid, never existed. Well, what about the Earth? Well, we all know that we have one large moon, but there have been speculations at times of a second moon. In fact, in 1846, at the Toulouse Observatory, Frederick Pettit reported the detection of a second moon of the Earth. Now, I'm not quite sure how he came up with this theory or what it was he was looking at, but so respected was the observatory that this report was taken so seriously, a lot of people believed in it, including Jules Verne, when he wrote his book, From the Earth to the Moon, he actually talks about the spacecraft flying past Pettit's moon on its journey. So confident were people that it must exist. Of course, it doesn't. What we do have is a companion in space. We go around the sun on our orbit, shown in blue in the top diagram there, taking a year to do so. And we are accompanied by a little asteroid called Cruithne. And Cruithne orbits the sun, and it also takes exactly one year. So it's in a resonant orbit with the Earth, and it approaches us fairly closely and then moves a long way away. And so if you take that first animation and you pin the Earth stationary as, along with the sun and let Cruithne and all the stars in the background move instead, then Cruithne seems to take this yellow path, this kidney being shaped so-called horseshoe orbit. Uh, it doesn't look much like a horseshoe in this diagram, but um, we'll see why that's used as the term in a moment. But 
this is not really a moon of the Earth, but uh, some people have described it as Earth's second moon. What does happen, and has happened several times in recent years, has been that we have acquired a second temporary moon. And in 2016, asteroid H03 was detected coming into orbit around the Earth as a temporary satellite. And it was really another near-Earth asteroid orbiting the Sun. But for a while, it appeared to be circling the Earth. Um, and then gradually perturbations took it away again uh, onto its orbit around the Sun. And this has happened with a number of asteroids in recent years. So we do occasionally have two moons. Another mystery, also involving those horseshoe orbits, is Saturn's strange double moon, Janus. Discovered in 1966, Janus behaved in a very peculiar way and seemed to elude people for quite a while. Its orbit seemed to be problematic. And the reason was it turned out to be two different moons now called Janus and Epimetheus. And these share an orbit around Saturn. They're co-orbital. If we look at a diagram of the orbit around Saturn that they take, they both interact at two different points around this orbital region. What happens is that Janus moves around Saturn but follows this blue loop and Epimetheus goes around this red horseshoe orbit around Saturn um, and they keep coming into con near contact with each other. They have these gravitational interactions at the point where Epimetheus is just about to turn round and so is Janus. They approach each other, they swap some energy and momentum and this causes the uh, effective direction of the orbit to slow down and speed up, respectively. So they're not orbiting round Saturn in alternating directions, I would have hasten to point out. It's just that as Epimetheus catches up with Jace, uh, Janus, it will slow Janus down, which puts Janus into a slightly lower orbit, and then that orbits faster in a lower orbit, so it then accelerates and pulls away. And so they swap um, from high to low orbital tracks as they keep approaching and uh, swapping energy and momentum, which occurs in these two points in the orbit. Very, very peculiar indeed. And the final little tale for this concerns Mars's moons. Phobos and Deimos shown here. Now these weren't discovered until 1877, but the scientist Kepler had looked at the number of known moons, which was that Venus had none, that we had one, that Mar um, Mars came next, and after that Jupiter was known to him to have the four Galilean satellites. And so it seemed reasonable that um, there was a number between one and four, namely two. And so he guessed that we might find Mars had two satellites, never discovered during his time. But Asaph Hall in 1877 found both Phobos and Deimos, really quite tiny moonlets orbiting around Mars. But there is a real mystery. And this is that in 1726, Jonathan Swift wrote Gulliver's Travels. And if you look into the book, you go to part two, chapter three, The Voyage to Laputa. And in there, it refers to Laputa's astronomers having discovered two moons of Mars. Now, maybe he was aware of Kepler's guess, but this was 150 years before we actually discovered the objects themselves. But he makes some statements concerning them. What he says is that the innermost moon will orbit in just 10 hours, very rapidly, and the second moon takes 21 and a half. 
Well, the actual figures are 7.6 hours and 30.3 hours. So they're not that far away. They're within 50% in both cases of the right answer. So if you're going to take a wild guess, maybe you'd guess two in the same way that Kepler did, but then you'd have to guess their nature and their orbits. And to get both of them within 50% of the truth and in the same sort of pattern, really, is quite an achievement. So maybe Mars's moons had been discovered earlier um, and, and maybe Swift had some inside information. Um, we just don't know. It's a real mystery. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you had some fun learning a few things about some rather odd observations.